Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, for anybody who has questions, you can type them into the Q&A and I'll answer them all at the end. I did want to let you know that I am recording this session, so this will be posted on our website at some point in the future. Just to let you know, um, obviously none of your videos are on, but just to let you know that it will be recorded for future use. So thank you all for joining today. My name is Sabrina Kaiser and I am one of the advisors in the study abroad office. And today I'm gonna to walk through some program options for you um, specifically for studying Chinese language. And then also a bit about some programs in China, Singapore and Taiwan that are not language focused. So that's what we're gonna go through today. And as I mentioned, just if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A. All right, so let's dive right in. Okay, I just, again, just a reminder, the session is being recorded. Um, and just to give you a, a little update about study abroad and COVID-19. So the current state of affairs, obviously it's been a little bit of a bumpy road <laughs> with regards to study abroad and the situation with COVID-19. So um, unfortunately our summer 2020 programs and all of our fall 2020 programs have been canceled at this point. So we're really hopeful that spring 2021 is going to run. We are looking forward to blue skies ahead and hopefully study abroad can, um, you know, bounce back and get back on track starting in spring 2021. So those deadlines for spring programs, and I'll tell you, I'll get into the kind of program, the differences in program types in just a second, but just to give you an overview, the deadlines for UCEP programs are May 18th and June 8th. However, those, a lot of the, most of those um, programs that we're working with for spring, the deadlines for those will be postponed. So I know for most of my programs, the deadlines have been pushed back from June 8th to August 1st and September 1st. So check our website. If you go to studyabroad.ucsd.edu, you can look at the deadlines for all the different programs through EAP and see which ones were extended. So again, if you are interested in a spring 2021 program, take a look at that. There might still be time to apply. There is a non-refundable one-time fee. It's an administrative fee of $100. You will, so that's not refundable, but if you apply for a program and you withdraw at any time before the withdrawal deadline, which for spring programs is usually November 1st or right around there, um, then you won't be charged any additional fees. It would just be that $100 administrative fee. If you have more questions about that and your specific situation, definitely let me know. And then for EAP 2021, 2022. So thinking kind of farther out, like fall 2021 and beyond, um, you'll want to check our website and see when um, you can check for uh, application information, deadlines, all of that coming up in late summer, early fall. So that's all that will be updated at that point. And then for global seminars, which are our faculty led programs, they're going to announce their summer 2021 options on our website in um, early fall. So check back for that. Um, okay, so moving right along here. So there are four ways to go abroad that I'll talk to you about today. Um, some of these you may have heard of, there are a lot of acronyms that float around, so I just kind of want to break that all down for you. So the global seminars, those are our summer faculty-led programs, and I won't go into too much, I won't go into too much depth about those in this webinar. Um, just I'll tell you briefly that those are summer programs that run for five weeks. You take two courses for four units each, so you get eight units total, and those are led by UCSD faculty. What's really great about those one thing that's really great is that it's really small class sizes. So it's usually about 15 to 28 students on a global seminar program. And we usually have about 20 global seminars running every summer. So again, all of the ones for this summer were unfortunately canceled due to COVID-19, but there will be a fresh batch of programs running next summer, and those will be up on the website this fall. Um, at the moment, so the ones that, of the ones that were, that were running this summer, there weren't any that were focused on Chinese language acquisition, but depending on what proposals come in for next summer, um, stay tuned and you know that might be an option in the future. 
And then next we have UCEAP. So that stands for Education Abroad Program. That's our most popular option. Um, it doesn't mean that it's the only option or even that it's the best option for you necessarily. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about what the EAP programs entail in just a second as we will with Opportunities Abroad programs, and we generally use the acronym OAP for that. Um, again, we'll get into what that entails and how it's different from EAP in just a second. And then we have UC San Diego Global Exchanges. So the, this is kind of a new development within our office. And we have about, I believe we have four or five exchanges at the moment, um, more to come in the future. But these are literal exchanges where we have students from a university abroad that come study at UCSD, and then we send students to that university. Um, at the moment, we don't have any in um, China, Singapore, or Taiwan, but I will keep you posted. More information on that will be on the website if we do happen to open up those partnerships in the future. So now to kind of dive into each of these, or really mainly EAP and OAP specifically. So EAP, again, it's our largest program partner. There are options in over 40 different countries through EAP. It is designed for the UCs, so it's open only to UC students. There are summer, quarter, semester, I should say, and year options. So I'll get into the quarter versus semester uh, breakdown in, in future slides. And then on EAP programs, you're going to earn UC units. You'll get grades that will be factored into your UCSD GPA. And any financial aid that you get would apply to an EP program, whether that's federal, state, or UCSD aid. So that's um, something to keep in mind if you are receiving UC, UC specific aid, it would apply to an EP program. So again, EP, it tends to be our most popular program option. It doesn't mean that it is the only option. And for reasons that I'll explain in the next slide, it might not even be the best one for you. So if we look at OAP programs, so again, that stands for Opportunities Abroad Program. This is essentially a network of study abroad providers. So you can study abroad through a provider outside of EAP, and then you can also directly enroll at any accredited university abroad. So this really opens up your options quite a bit. And the main difference here is that on OAP programs, you would get transfer credit instead of UC credit. And you can use federal and state financial aid on OAP programs, but not UC specific aid. So if we go to the next slide here, to break it down, um, for EAP, again, you can use all of your financial aid, you earn UC units, and you'll get grades that factor into your GPA. Um, global seminars, I touched on that briefly already. So for the difference between OAP and EAP, a reason why you might look into OAP instead of EAP would be if you don't meet UC EAP's eligibility requirements in terms of standing um, your year in school, your GPA, or language uh, prerequisites. Visits. Another reason might be if you want to go on a special focus program. So I'll tell you about a program offered in China through one of our study abroad providers that has a very specific focus and it's not a program option that you would find through EAP. Um, another option would be if you want to go to a university or country not offered by UCEP. So as I mentioned, there are programs in over 40 countries, but obviously that leaves quite a bit um, that is not offered through EAP. So if you were looking at a country or if you know of a particular university abroad that you'd like to study at, and we don't have that partnership through EAP, you can definitely do that. You can directly enroll through OAP. Um, if you're an out-of-state resident or an international student and you don't want to pay non-resident tuition, so if you are, if you're doing an EAP program and you're an out-of-state student, because EAP is designed for the UCs, there is that out-of-state um, non-resident tuition fee that's attached to an EAP program. So it can actually be more financially feasible to do an OAP program if you're an out-of-state or international student. Again, we can kind of talk through the particulars of your financial situation, um, and we can see kind of which programs might work best for you. But just as a general rule, um, this would be a reason why students might opt for OAP over EAP in certain situations. So let's get into some of those OAP options. So again, as I mentioned, you can directly enroll at any accredited university abroad. So if you have a question about a specific university, if you don't know if it's accredited or if it would work for OAP, you can always send us an email and let us know what university you are interested in and then we can dig in a little deeper and make sure that that would be an option. And then through providers, so 
essentially, as I mentioned, UC EAP is a study abroad provider that was designed for the UCs. And then there are a ton of other providers that are designed for students, you know, in any university across the nation. So there's a provider that we work with called CIEE. We've been working with them for a number of years and they're really great. We've had extremely positive experiences working with them and we've sent a lot of students on CIEE OAP options. And they have a particular um, program called Accelerated Chinese Language in Shanghai. So if you were looking into, if you wanted to study Chinese language and you were looking at the EAP options and for whatever reason they weren't speaking to you or they didn't work for you, this could be a great alternative option. Through USAC, which is another provider, there's a Chinese language and culture studies program in Chengdu. And then through SIT, which is another provider, there's health, environment, and traditional Chinese medicine. So I believe that's a traveling program where they go to at least two different cities in China. And again, that is a specific focus program where you know you might not find offering an offering like that through the EAP portfolio. So that is, again, a reason to potentially look into OAP and see what options exist for you there. Okay, and now we'll look at UC EAP options for studying Chinese specifically, and then we'll get into the non-language options in just a minute. So at Peking University in Beijing, there's a program called Chinese in Beijing, and that has two options for you. You can do a summer program for eight weeks or the fall program, which is roughly four months. So on either of those programs, you would take two intensive Chinese language courses in simplified Mandarin for a total of 15 units of language study. So if you're just doing the summer program for eight weeks, you're getting 15 units total, and you're just taking those two intensive Chinese language classes. If you're going for the fall, you can also take one to two English taught courses these are usually lower division um, and they cover things like Chinese history, politics, culture. Um, so that is, those are not gonna be courses like you know, engineering courses or biology courses. They're usually kind of more social sciences and generally lower division. So again, if you're doing that program, you wanna be sure that your main focus and your main goal for that time is to be studying the language because that's the majority, of, uh, the majority of your time is gonna be devoted to that. And then um, at National Taiwan University, there's a program called Chinese in Taipei. That's a summer program for six weeks. And on that program, you're gonna take one Chinese language course in traditional Mandarin and then one exploring Taiwan course. So that would be the language course is nine units, exploring Taiwan would be three. So you'd get 12 total units. So again, I mean, obviously you can see here the differences. The Peking program is a little bit longer at eight weeks. Also, it is, you'll get um, a total of 15 units as opposed to 12. It's simplified Mandarin versus at the program in Taiwan on the program in Taipei, it's traditional. So I would say the program at Peking is a little bit more intensive. Um, and again, that's offered in summer and fall, whereas the NTU program in Taipei is just summer and it's six weeks. So that might help you kind of differentiate between the two and determine which one is gonna be a better fit for you. All right, and so application info for those programs, the deadline is going to be early February for both summer and fall. It's a two-part application, so you'll do part through EAP and part through our Tritons Abroad application system. Within the Tritons Abroad application system, you're gonna see what's called an academic planning form. That form is signed by your major, minor, and college advisors. And so in that way, we're sort of pre getting your courses pre-approved by your advisors. And then when you return from abroad, you'll get your courses sort of post-approved um, by your advisors again. So we're always looping in your advisors. We want them to know where you're going, when you're going, what classes you're taking to be sure that it works for you academically. One question that a lot of students ask is, so let's say you want to do a summer program and you want to study Chinese and it's not counting for your major or your minor or for college requirements, that's absolutely doable. It doesn't have to count towards any of that for you to go on the program. So if you are an engineering major and you um, decide that you want to study intensive Chinese abroad during the summer, that's great. Um, most students will be taking the courses for either major minor or college requirements, but again, you don't have to be. 
And for eligibility, you just have to be in sophomore standing for um, any of the programs that I just mentioned, the summer or fall at Peking or the summer program in Taipei. So that sophomore standing at the time of the start of the program. Um, and then for the GPA requirement, it's 2.5 for Peking and then 2.85 for NTU. These programs do not have an enrollment limit. So as long as you meet those eligibility requirements, you're essentially guaranteed to be selected. So you don't need to think about applying for a backup program. Um, and if you don't meet those GPA requirements for whatever reason, just let me know because sometimes EAP can actually be flexible with that. So don't think that just because you don't meet the requirement, it's absolutely a no-go. There might be flexibility, so definitely get in touch with me if that's the case. Um, but again, really, if you meet those requirements, you're pretty much good to go, which is nice. And for that reason, we don't allow students to apply to more than one program unless they are, you know, borderline with a GPA or if there's some, if they're kind of extenuating circumstances, which you would just need to let us know about. So in general, it's just choose a program, apply for it. And especially with these, because there's no enrollment limit, you're essentially guaranteed to be selected. So that is really nice um, that it's not too difficult of an application process and as long as you're eligible you are selected. Okay so now we'll get into a couple uh, a few non-language programs in China, Singapore, and Taiwan. Um, so for China, there are quite a few options here. So at Peking University, as I mentioned, obviously there's the language focus for fall, uh, for summer or for fall. And then you can also do a spring or year option. On this program, they do not accept students who hold only a PRC passport. So if you have dual citizenship, um, you can apply for this program, but if you only have a PRC passport, unfortunately, about a year and a half ago, they changed that eligibility requirement and they no longer um, accept students with just a PRC passport. So, um, but if you you know hold another passport or you are a dual citizen, then you can do the spring or year program at Peking and that would not not have a language focus. You can take courses taught in Chinese if your language abilities are, um, are that high, or you can take courses taught in English in various different disciplines. You can also take language study while you're there, but it's not the focus of the program. And then at Fudan University in Shanghai, they have a um, fall or spring option. They have English taught courses in humanities and social sciences, and they also have a Shanghai Summer International um, International Summer School, I should say. I should remove one of those summers. Um, and that is kind of a traditional international summer school where you take two to three classes. They are all taught in English and they have a kind of a pretty wide range of course offerings in terms of different disciplines, a lot in humanities and social sciences, I will say. So one thing to note here about the spring term is that um, most of our partners abroad and certainly all the ones listed here, the springs, they're on the semester calendar. So the spring semester would cut into our winter and spring quarter. So if you're planning to do a spring semester on any of these programs, you're going to be missing winter and spring quarter at UCSD. That's absolutely doable. I have students who do that all the time. Um, it just takes a little bit of pre-planning. We want to be sure that you're staying on track to graduate on time, obviously. So it just, yeah, it, it takes a bit of um, coordinating with your academic advisors to be sure that that's feasible for you. So let's see, where was I? Going back to Tsinghua University in Beijing. So that program, again, similar to the Peking program, they do not accept students who only hold a PRC passport. Um, so I should say that Fudan is the only one that does accept students who only hold a PRC passport. And at Tsinghua, you can take English taught coursework primarily in engineering, economics, and business. So again, if you wanted to talk more about your specific situation, the types of classes you want to take, definitely feel free to reach out to me and we can kind of explore a little bit further which program might work best for you. Again, these are at Fudan and Tsinghua, you can take language courses, but that is not the focus of the program. 
And then something that's a little bit different is the CIEE Summer Global Internship in Shanghai. So that's a fairly new program. It's been running for about two summers and it is run through EAP, but it's actually a program that's offered through another provider, which is CIEE. And on those summer global internships, this is a program that is very different from the traditional study abroad experience. So the main focus is an internship where you're working about 35 to 40 hours a week at your placement. And that is over an eight week period. And you, in addition to that internship experience, there's a very kind of small academic component attached. So that would be like once a week you would do a webinar or potentially meet in person with your cohort. But again, that main focus is on the internship. And like I said, you're working pretty much full time in that internship and you're getting nine units of credit for that experience. So it is an academic experience in that you're getting academic units, but essentially you're working for the summer while you're there. And just to give you an idea of some of the types of internships that have been offered in the past, so in Shanghai, um, this is a slide from CIE. Again, they host these programs and they're offered through EAP so that students can get UC credit for those internships that they're doing. So in Shanghai, the strengths are listed here. Um, the challenges, so they, if you're a student who's looking for an internship in one of the industries listed under challenges, as, an, as, as they imply here, that might be a little bit more difficult but um, if you're interested, reach out to me, let me know, and we can look into whether or not there might be options for you. But if you are interested in one of the industries that falls under the strengths category, then you can rest assured that they probably would have something that would work pretty well for you. So that's kind of an exciting, a um, little bit different type of program that we're happy to offer. And they have been pretty popular in the past couple summers. We've had a good number of students who've decided to do these and they've all had really great experiences. Okay, moving right along to Singapore. So Singapore doesn't have quite as many options as China does. So at the National University of Singapore, they have a fall, spring, or year option. They All their courses are taught in English, and they have a pretty wide array of courses taught for um, different disciplines, different majors. So it works really well, actually, for students across the board. Um, so that, again, fall, spring, or year, they are on the semester calendar. So if you went for spring, you would miss winter and spring quarter. And then they also offer a biodiversity summer program, again, hosted at NUS. So National University of Singapore hosts fall, spring, year, and that summer program. The biodiversity program is obviously very specific to science students. Um, as you'll see in the description there, you learn about tropical freshwater and seawater ecosystems, investigate distinct habitats. So it um, definitely has a very specific focus. So we usually have just a handful of students on that program every summer, and the ones who do it really, really enjoy it. So again, unique opportunity for you there. Um, and then through CIE, they also offer a summer global internship in Singapore. So in addition to the one offered in Shanghai, they have almost an identical format offered in Singapore. And for anybody interested in um, programs in other cities that are that for other cities that offer that same summer global internship, excuse me, you can find that in Berlin as well as um, Cape Town, South Africa and Hong Kong. So if you wanted to look into that again, exactly the same format where you're doing an eight-week program. It's focused on that internship. And for Singapore, I'll show you here, these are the um, strengths and challenges that they've faced um, finding internships in Singapore in different industries. So take a look at that and see um, if there are, you know, if there's an industry that you're interested in under the strengths category, then that would be likely that you could find something that would work for you. So I'll leave this up here for just a second for you to read through that. Um, and I believe we had about eight or nine students, if I remember correctly, on this program last summer. As I mentioned, all the ones for this summer have been canceled, but we did have a few who were, um, more than a few who were interested in doing this this summer. So hopefully by next summer, everything will be back up and running and this program will be pretty popular, I imagine. Okay. 
moving along to Taiwan. So, and in Taiwan, we work with National Taiwan University, and this is again the university that hosts the summer program that is language focused. But if you're not looking to do a language focused program, you could look at fall, spring, or year at NTU. Um, they don't allow students who only hold a Taiwanese passport to apply. So, again, if you're a dual citizen, um, you can certainly apply for this program. But if not, you'll want to look into something else. And for fall, spring, or year, you'll see here that they offer coursework taught in English in engineering, economics, and management. Um, but for humanities and social science, most of those offerings are taught in Chinese. There are a few exceptions to that, though. So don't rule it out if you wanted to take just maybe one or two courses in humanities or social sciences taught in English. They also have a summer research program. So that again is not kind of your typical traditional summer program abroad. It's a, it's a research focused program where you're taking one research course. So you're in a lab that's a six week program if I remember correctly. And the lab offerings, you can find those on the EEP website to get a sense of what types of labs they've offered in the past. So if you are, they have a lot, particularly in biology, um, they have some that work for like psychology and neuroscience. So take a look on the EEP website and see if you are interested in research, that could be a really great fit. You just wanna look through there and see if they have any um, lab courses that look interesting to you and that might fit with your your academic plan. So yeah, I think that is it for everything, all the programs in Taiwan. I'll move along here to financing your study abroad. So a lot of students ask about how to make this affordable, um, you know, how financial aid works, what scholarships are available. So as I mentioned, for UC EAP, any financial aid that you receive can be applied to those EAP programs. And for OAP, you can apply federal and state, but not UC specific aid. We have a financial aid advisor in our office. Her name is Tina Brilly, and she is an amazing resource for you. If you receive aid at UCSD, I'd highly recommend that you set up an appointment with her, and I'll tell you how to do that in just a few slides. So she can actually pull up your financial aid account. She can show you exactly how the aid that you normally receive will transfer to your program abroad. Um, she holds a financial aid workshop every Thursday at 3.30. That'll be running for at least the next few weeks, um, and it might run through the summer as well. So check that out if you're interested. There's also a short module um, on our website called Backpacking Through the Basics of Financial Aid and Study Abroad. It might be a good idea to start there, watch that, and then um, you know, make a list of questions that you have when you meet with Tina. So just kind of get the basics. And then when you meet with her, you can dig into the specifics and the nuances of your financial aid package. For scholarships, so every year UCSD students receive over $800,000 in, $800, in special study abroad scholarships and grants. So we, I always tell students apply for anything and everything that you're eligible for because I've seen students get multiple scholarships for one program and that has really helped in mitigating the costs of some of these programs. With that said, there are um, some programs that are more affordable than others. So on the EAP website for each of these programs and through OAP providers as well, you can see what the different costs of the programs are and kind of compare price points to see which one might suit you and your financial situation the best. So getting back to the scholarships though, so we do offer scholarships through our office, through EAP, through OAP providers, through national scholarships, and each college at UCSD also offers scholarships. So there's a lot of money out there. Um, again, I always encourage students to apply for anything and everything that they're eligible for because it's free money and that is really nice instead of taking out loans and, and you know, going down that route. So I always encourage everybody to apply, apply, apply. I know it's another thing that you have to do, but we do hold scholarship essay writing workshops in our office. And if we're not back in the office in the fall, we'll be doing those virtually. That Those, those workshops are really, really helpful because we go over essays that have won awards in the past. So you kind of get an idea of what the committees are looking for, how to format your essay, and how to make yourself really stand out um, as a as, as a great candidate for those scholarships. So check those out. Those will be posted on the calendar on our website when we schedule those for fall and then for winter and spring 2021. And as I mentioned, there are plenty of affordable program options 
take a look on our EEP website um, at the cost for the programs that you're interested in and um, let me know if you have any questions about that. We can talk more in depth. Okay, so next steps. So a lot of times, I know it can be a little bit overwhelming to look at our website because there's a lot of information there. On our website, like I mentioned, for any EAP program and for OAP providers as well, you can get a lot of information about the cost, the housing, um, the different classes that are offered, the institution itself. So definitely check that out and then get advised. And for advising, I'll explain kind of what we're doing in these remote times. So we have drop-in advising. That's going to be shorter in length. No appointment is necessary. That's kind of just quick questions or if you're like really getting started and just have very general inquiries about um, how to get started. So for that, you can drop in on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday at 10.30. And again, that's just kind of a quick uh, question answering um, kind of opportunity. And then for scheduled advising, that's going to be more of an in-depth half hour meeting with an, with an advisor who probably advises on, you know, for the portfolio that you're interested in. So that's why we ask that um, you send a virtual advising center message and tell us three available times, but also the program or country of interest. So for example, if you're thinking, I, I know that I want to study either in China or Taiwan, you would want to send us a message in the virtual advising center and say, I'm available on these three days at this time, and I'm interested in studying in China or Taiwan. And then that, that message would get forwarded to me, Sabrina, as the advisor for those programs. If you're interested in um, you know, a program outside of Asia, obviously each advisor in our office has a different portfolio, and we do a bit of cross advising, so we will direct you to the appropriate advisor and we'll get you on their calendar. Another thing that you could do is you could write in and say, I am a biology major and I want to know what programs work best for biology students, or I'm you know, a psychology student or engineering or whatever it may be. And then we will also direct you to the appropriate advisor. So each of us is a liaison with different departments across campus, so we can um, direct you to the appropriate person to help with that. And if you have a preferred advisor, let's say you've worked with one of us in the past and you want to kind of maintain that and meet with us again, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. So just write, you know, I've met with Rachel before, I've met with Luis before, and I'd like to schedule an appointment with them again. And we can go ahead and do that. And then just one more quick plug for the rest of our webinars. We're coming up at the end of them here. So tomorrow, it looks like we have the Spanish speaking countries webinar. And then actually tomorrow as well is the STEM majors webinar. So if any of you have friends that might be interested in those or you yourself is interested, go ahead and check those out. Um, and then we will be planning more webinars, I'm sure in the coming weeks, but this is what we've got running so far. So with that, I think I will open it up. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, and it looks like we have a few in the Q&A, so I'll just read those aloud and answer them live here. And then, like I said, if you have any questions for me after this, you can always send me a virtual advising center message. Just select study abroad and then write to Sabrina in the message, and that will get forwarded to me. You can also send an email to our abroad account, but we prefer that all the communication go through the back. So... I, we ask that you start there. So let me go ahead and open these questions. Okay, so one student is asking, where can I find this recording later? So we're going to be posting all these on our website. I'm not exactly sure like where exactly which drawer that will be in on our website. Um, but if you send me a virtual advising center message, I can be sure to send this PowerPoint to you and then I can let you know when this is up and where exactly to find it. Um, that's another question that came in. So yeah, just since I, so I have you specifically on my radar, send me a VAC message and then I will forward along the PowerPoint and I'll let you know as soon as we get this recording up. Great questions. Thank you. Okay. Does, okay, so that's a great question. Somebody's asking if a Hong Kong passport counts as a PRC passport. It does not. So if you hold um, a Hong Kong passport, you can study on those programs at Peking or at Xinhua. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. 
All right, for the non-language program, does this mean that the courses taught are in either English or Chinese or just Chinese? So great question. For the programs that are non-language programs, most of the courses would be taught, well, I shouldn't say most, some courses are taught in English and some courses are taught in Chinese. So if you have language ability that would allow you to take a course taught in Chinese, you can do that. Um, but all of those programs do offer English taught courses, some of them more than others. So for example, with the Xinhua program, they don't offer quite as many courses taught in English as you would find at Fudan University. So if you wanna, um, there's a little bit more information about that on our website if you look through the specific course list, but I can also, I can share that, or you and I can meet and we can talk more in depth about what, like what types of courses you're looking at, and then we can see which program would probably be a best fit for you. Yeah, great question, thank you. Is the CIE summer program part of the UCE? Yes, so the CIE summer program is part of the UCEP portfolio. I know that gets very confusing because we're because CIE you can do a CIE program through OAP. That's when it's not part of the EAP portfolio, but the CIE summer global internships are currently run through EAP. So they are designed by CIE, but they're run through EAP so that um, UC students can get that UC credit for that for that experience. So yeah, great question. The CAE summer global internships in Shanghai and in Singapore and in the other cities of Berlin, Cape Town, and Hong Kong, that's all run through EAP. So they're considered EAP programs. Thank you for asking that. Would the UC system provide housing options where we have to find it on our own? Another great question. So in most cases, they do offer housing either on campus in the dorms or in off-campus student apartments. So you wouldn't have to find it on your own. It would be offered as part of the application process. They're gonna ask you if you want to opt in to housing on campus or if you wanna do the student apartments off campus. Um, and you can also opt out of that altogether. So some people have family or friends in the area that they're studying abroad in and they want to stay with them. That's totally fine. So yeah, if you want to do the housing that they provide through the program, that's great. But if you don't, you can opt out of that. It's a good question. Thank you for that. Any other questions? I'll stick on for a little bit longer. I know we've finished a bit early. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. Um, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, but yeah, so I'll just stick around for a little bit longer to see if anybody else has anything to ask. If not, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you all are hanging in there with remote learning. Um, somebody's asked me, what is your email address again? So it's S M Kaiser. That's S as in Sabrina, and then M as in Mary, Kaiser, K-A-I-S-E-R, at ucsd.edu. However, we do um, ask that all the communication go through the Virtual Advising Center, so it'd be best to just go into the VAC and select Study Abroad, and then write to Sabrina in the body of the message, and then it'll get forwarded to me. So that's kind of a mandate um, from administration at UCSD that all of our communication is recorded in the virtual advising center. However, if you are a new student at UCSD, you don't, you're not able to access the VAC yet, definitely feel free to go ahead and send me an email. And again, that's S-M Kaiser, K-A-I-S-E-R at uh, ucsd.edu. All right. Thank you. Somebody said thank you in the chat. Thank you all for coming. Um, again, I really appreciate you being here. And I hope that we see you all either via virtual advising or back in the office, hopefully in the fall.